going to review modes of ventilation and how we can pick up some initial settings. So it shouldn't be too bad today, hopefully. <laughs> So again, when you're picking a type of mechanical ventilation for a patient, this and back a couple of PowerPoints too. We have to think about where are we needing to set it up? How long do we think we might have to have them ventilated? Um, and this is a permanent situation where they're going to have to go home like that. So our indications, why do they need support? What pathology is involved? And does the ventilator need to have any kind of special ventilatory modes like, you know, APRV or bi-level? Do you care? Are you going to use it if you have it? Uh, treatment goals, what is our purpose? And how long will somebody be on the vent? Our patient interface can be anything, right? I could put a mask on you and do it with a non-invasive like a Vision or a V60. I could also use a mask with a, a machine as long as I put it in non-invasive setting. And you guys have fired up machines now where you realize it's got a um, intubating side and then a non-invasive side and you can pick and choose. <clears throat> By the way, for fun this morning, we fired up our baby Hal. <clears throat> he actually moves, he cries. He actually, he'll, he looks at you, he'll track you. Oh, no. He's pretty cool. Oh, I scared the hell out of one of the students. She's like, I can't stand dolls. She wouldn't touch it. I was like, get over there and touch him. Oh, poor thing. But yeah, he, he does some pretty cool stuff. I didn't know because I never fired him up before. But yeah, he actually, he, he cries. And he's got really awesome bad breath. <laughs> so one day we'll play with him and you can fire him up to see what Another thing too, Dr. O pulled me aside and asked me to do, we're going to do this anyway because I plan to, but he wants to make sure I tell you, we are going to start going through some board style questions. He's going to hook us up with the um, practice board that he gives to the seniors, and you're going to start them early. So you can kind of see what those questions are like and how come they're written so stupid, you need to start to learn how to do those. So at the end of this class, he wants me to take a couple of lab days where we're going to practice doing some of those tests and just kind of see what you're up against, okay? Um, so duration, how long do we need to keep somebody intubated? Is this going to be, does it have to be a really fancy event with graphics or can it be a less complicated ventilator that you're going to use like an LTAC? What does um, AMG have? What kind of events are they? So I don't know if 
if you know, but one little link of tubing, one tiny link of this blue tubing here, just this much, that's 50 ml of dead space added. That's a lot. So every piece of this that I have, that's a lot of dead space that I'm adding to the patient circuit. So you're going to see questions like this on the board. <clears throat> Or they actually give you dead space. So if they're telling you that you have a certain amount of dead space involved, I need to fix ventilation, but this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to pull the dead space first. That was that question. Okay. So if it ever tells you dead space is of value, take it away. Okay. If you don't list it, they want you to take it. So they list dead space. You have to get rid of it. Very easy. Short your tubing. Okay. Hi, Cassandra. Hi. <laughs> Tell me what ventilators you guys use in AMG. The LTV 200? I don't think it's LTV. I'm, I'm totally, I'm not going to Google it. I can't, I can't I'll, this. I'll look one up. Huh? I'll, I'll look it up, I'll show you. I uh, can't place it. <clears throat> we were just talking about where you're going to use your mechanical ventilator and for how long. <laughs> and you're not going to buy a vent that's $100,000 if you're using it for long term acute care. <clears throat> glorified BiPAP, huh? Yeah. I got you. Because I don't know, I know that um, Kendra just got some recently too, but I don't know which one's great Anyways, if you're given somebody who has a respiratory acidosis, who's already on a vent, and you're given dead space to correct ventilation, So there's four kinds of dead space, as you told them to me. How do you Just take the pieces, extra pieces of tubing. Like right, you see the circuit where you've got the inspiratory limb, then you have an MT or a MDI involved, then you have the extra piece of tubing for the closed suction system, and then you get to the patient, where there's that much real estate now, extra. So you just take out as much as you can. Take out as much of it as you can, yep. And now get rid of it. Is there a specific amount that we have to take out, or just? It's no. If they give it to you, take it away. It doesn't matter if it's 150, 250, 450, who cares? Just throw it out. Get rid of it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. Sorry about that. There you go. I apologize. I thought that was off. So dead space. There's some stuff we can correct and some stuff we can't. So anatomic dead space is built into you as a human. Okay? That is the one we do the formula for where we find out your body weight. Tubed, 143 and level dead space not. 
So it's a pretty big difference. Yeah, and time is at stake. Now we also have things like shunting, where you're having blood flow, um, but it's not touching particular parts of the lungs, or maybe you don't have enough hemoglobin in your blood to carry oxygen, so there's all kinds of problems with that. <clears throat> and that's gonna be our VQ mismatching, our ventilation perfusion abnormality. We have to diagnose these guys with a CT scan, or you can do a VQ scan. Have you heard of that before? We have a patient breathing a radio tagged gas. That's usually a xenon. And then they get something called a syntogram, which are pictures. And the pictures go around the chest, and it kind of creates a rough outline of the lungs as we look. If it shows up in the pictures, like lungs, that means ventilation is fine. The gas got everywhere it's supposed to go. Then they stick an IV in somebody and do the same thing with the radioactive I, um, I, albumin, and they do the circulatory side and scan, and they match the two. And so if I've got perfusion, but no circulation, what does proven to be? Okay, we're gonna talk about that more later. Why would they do that instead of just the CT? Exactly, because it's actually more definitive to tell you exactly where the area is um, and how extensive it is, but as you are gonna point out to me in a moment, it takes a long time. And CTs I can have done in five minutes. So CTs are better. <clears throat> now, what you might wanna do a VQ scan for later on, and I wonder if these covid people who are getting fibrosis and stuff, won't be in a trial for some VQ scans to see what they're looking with as a deficit after. Diffusion defects, like fibrosis. That's gonna have an issue as well. Um, bullous emphysema, where you don't have um, alveolar connection as well. So our debt based ventilation is defined as the amount of volume that does not participate in gas exchange. So it's moving around, but it's actually not doing any work for us. Dead space is also defined as ventilation in excess of perfusion. So that means we have ventilation getting to the lung, parenchyma, but it's not being used <coughs> up by the circulatory system. The board sometimes talk about dead space is volume rebreathe or wasted ventilation. Those are older terms, but you need to put them in your book, okay? Put them in your brain. So you just tell me the four types, and yes, there they are. So mechanical, then they take plastic. That's all of our ventilator circuit. <clears throat> Physiologic is a product of anatomic and alveolar. So our anatomic dead space is based on whether you're intubated or not, and based on your ideal body weight, and the examples are over here. Anatomic dead space does not change in an individual unless they get taller, <laughs> Like see suddenly grow, okay, or you have an artificial airway. That's the only time your anatomic dead space would ever change. And I think about some of these kids that went away, you probably have nieces or nephews that went away for a summer and came back a foot taller. <laughs> You're like, how'd that happen? Those guys are gonna have more anatomic dead space. My daughter has a friend who is six eight right now, and he's just now 19. He has a lot of dead space. It's like looking at a tree. It's very tall. Super goofy, but very tall. Nice kid, but he's, he's always, huh? Old people when they shrink. That's right, yeah, he also shrink. The longer the airway, the more anatomic dead space. So somebody with an ET tube is gonna have a little more dead space than somebody with a trach. So a trach is the shortest amount of mechanical dead space we can offer a patient, which is another reason why having somebody trach is nice. So alveolar dead space is the amount of volume that fills the area of the alveoli but is not perfused for whatever reason. Alveolar dead space is typically small. Most times we consider it pretty insignificant. Um, unless you have global alveolar disease, and I maybe not. Alveolar dead space increases significantly with pulmonary emboli or other dead space diseases like ARDS, and unfortunately our friends with COVID. And it's abbreviated VDALV for alveolar. Physiologic dead space is the product of anatomic and alveolar. So again, most people aren't really that specific about listing this out, but physiologic dead space increases when alveolar dead space increases. <coughs> Excuse me, that should make sense, right? The more dead space you have of either anatomic or alveolar, the more physiologic dead space you can have. Physiologic dead space is abbreviated VD 
P-H-Y-S, this is your logic. So I can find anatomic dead space this way, and I can actually find the amount of volume that's missing if I were to look and see how much of my ventilated patient's volume I'm losing by doing this calculation. There's also another way to estimate it. We call this the VD to VT ratio, so dead space ratio. This looks at how much of inspired tidal volume is actual dead space volume, and you're going to hear this a lot. This is a very old formula. We call it Paco Pico Paco. Dead space formula, Paco Pico Paco. So we take somebody's PaCO2 minus the end tidal that we're given, or it's on the monitor, divided by the PaCO2 again, you'll get a small decimal, and you're going to multiply it by 100 to get the percentage. Is there a formula for every kind of dead space or just this one? So this is the one, this is the ratio, and then we actually have a way to get a physical value for it, which we're going to do next. So we have that way for anatomic. Paco Pico Paco gives us the ratio, and then we have another way to do it. So there's three steps, there's three different sections, okay? So Paco Pico Paco, normal ratio is about 25 to 30%. So let's try one. Let's say you were told that somebody's CO2 on the blood gas was, let's say, 60. The end tidal was reading at 55. Okay, go ahead and try it. Tell me what you get. I have my industrial mask on today, and it's like so hard to breathe through. So I'm like all afraid that this is going to go pit. I'm like, I don't want it. <laughs> Has this <laughs> <clears throat> so that's not so, so bad, right? So let's try it again. Let's say our CO2 or PaCO2 on a blood gas is 100. And our end tidal reading something crazy like 80. What do you get? Find the percentage, or I actually could take that beginning portion where I had my 0 .08, and I can figure out what the actual loss or the actual dead space volume is. Okay. So first of all, are we clear on how to do this part right here? Okay. And then move on. I just got all weirded out there. You can do that. So if I wanted to take this a step further, So that gave you the ratio and then the percentage out of that, okay? 
But I also can take the same process and figure out what the actual loss volume is, <coughs> or the amount of tidal volume that's actually not participating. So the dead space volume I can find. Okay, where we did it here. Okay, I also can do it here. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the same beginning, your Paco Pico Paco, and then you're gonna multiply it by the tidal volume that you have been given. So, do this example. So you're gonna set it up. 48 minus 40 divided by 40, you get that little percentage. Don't multiply it by 100, you're gonna multiply it by the tidal volume. And then time once again. And are we multiplying the amount or the... Yes, yeah, just by, just by 500, yes. <coughs> Mechanical dead space is all of this nonsense over here. Okay, normal mechanical dead space with all that tubing is a lot. It's about 150 ml, quite a bit. Okay, so every time you add something more, you're getting more dead space. So if I need to get rid of it to correct an acidosis, any time it's listed as mechanical dead space, you have to throw it out, get rid of it. As Ray said, make your circuit as small as possible so don't get the job done. Okay. Remember, we use pressure support in a spontaneous breath to help the patient overcome all that crap in order to breathe, okay, where they're comfortable and not stuck in wind so hard. Now, if you don't have, if you don't deal with the dead space situation, lots of bad stuff's gonna happen. One, you're gonna have decreased ventilation. You will eventually have decreased oxygenation status, and the patient can become tachycardic. Because now the body has to work harder in order to try to get the oxygenated blood around the body. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? Okay. 
Now, there's some dead space diseases. Some of them we can fix, some of them we can't fix too well. PEs are not necessarily all that magically fixable initially. There certainly are treatments. Blood thinners is one, right? Put somebody on a heparin drip that will help with their pulmonary emboli. There are also mechanical treatments now that are happening where they try to go in through the blood vessel system of the lungs and physically grab the clot if, if it's big enough. It's kind of cool. But the standard of care is IV anticoagulants and then long term anticoagulants. But I have to treat the consequences of pulmonary embolus. And how do I do that? So what's a patient with a pulmonary emboli? What's their number one symptom? What does that look like on a saturation basis? What happens to their fat? Their fat's a crack, right? And you cannot get their saturation levels up or their PO to it because of this emboli. So we have to flood them with as much oxygen as we can. And if you had hyperbaric, like the board give you hyperbaric as a choice, that's a magical choice. Pick that, okay? Pulmonary hypertension, that's a pretty common problem, especially in our COVID friends. It's not being studied right now because the risk of putting in a pulmonary um, arterial catheter, a swan gas catheter in a patient is pretty high. Plus we're proning them, so we don't have good data. But I promise you, if you did, you would know these patients all have a lot of pulmonary hypertension. We're assuming that they do. So we're treating it with things like epoprostanol, remember that drug we talked about? And inhaled nitric oxide. Epoprostanol and inhaled nitric oxide. Those are pulmonary vasodilating drugs that are inhaled. Epoprostanol, inhaled nitric oxide. We are using a truckload of EPO on our COVID patients at Loveless. I don't know if it's helping. <laughs> Ideally, because it's a, it's a pulmonary vasodilator, you will see an improvement in their SpO2 and their PO2 pretty quickly within 10 minutes if it's working. Okay. This is a bit off topic, but yeah. I'm curious. You mentioned hyperbaric chambers. Um, and my mind is working slowly today. Uh, do you think that hyperbaric chambers would work for COVID patients? Like, do you think it would help? Or oh, I think it would help dramatically. But if you think about how many there are in this world. Oh, yeah, I know. There's I know. How many COVID, like, we don't even have one in, in New Mexico anymore, yeah. which is kind of sad. But if you look somewhere on the coast where there's a lot of dive accidents, they have more. Yeah. And I don't know if anybody's trying it, but we have to do something because that's the whole problem with COVID. We cannot yeah. oxygenate the patients. And I would imagine it would be an incredible benefit if you had one. But like, because I'm wondering, because it feels like it would help as long as you're in the chamber, but I, I don't know how much it would work like long term. Well, the I problem guess. is those patients have to be dealt with a lot. Like, there's a lot of physical yeah. interaction between the staff and the patient. In a chamber, unless it's a huge chamber where we could go in with the patient, mm -hmm. you couldn't do a run because yeah. the runs take hours. So, great idea though. So, what's so special about it? I mean, it's just giving them higher FiO2, isn't it? It's, not, it's, it's the same 100%, but it's at atmosphere. So, you're putting them under pressure. So, by doing so, we're forcing the oxygen molecules into the bloodstream that they actually physically attach better to the hemoglobin and they block the CO2. So, if you have somebody who's got carbon monoxide poisoning, for example, it will blow off the carbon monoxide molecules. It will help with the gas exchange for carbon dioxide as well. It's a wonderful idea. It just, I don't know that we're working COVID, but we don't have enough around to prove it. <laughs> so. so it's basically just added atmosphere? It's like a pressure cooker, right? Have you ever made beans on the stove <laughs> in a pressure cooker? Like if you're gonna boil them on all day. <laughs> oh, I don't like them either. I can't use them. I'm gonna blow my house up. <laughs> but my mother-in-law gave me one year for Christmas and I'm like, thank you. It's like a rice mash, I never looked at it. <laughs> Yeah, I won't do it. Or like her, the one she gave me was an ancient one and it had the little screw thing on top and it would just rattle. <coughs> so I was waiting for it to blow. I'm like, I am looking at Mount Vesuvius because I'm not dealing with this. But the concept, right? Under pressure, you get them cooked faster, right? So everything gets in there. Kind of same thing about hyperbaric. The more pressure forces the oxygen into the tissues better. Yeah, I don't have one. <laughs> like I want an Instapot. I'm even afraid of that. Like I, <laughs> I have one that's in a box. Do you? Yeah, I got it from the, the Instapot. I wish I got it like 12 years ago. Because I like to make beans and stuff, but I'm not dealing with all that. Like, I want to make some for but I bought the ones that you have to cook forever. I'm like, well, shoot, I better stuff tomorrow because we may get by Christmas. They work really well, but I have heard there's been issues with them exploding as well. My grandma used them. My mother-in-law has a show. She puts everything in it. Yeah, I can't.
But same idea. <laughs> so pressure gets oxygen to the tissues better. And actually, hyperbaric too is really good for like um, um, micro um, adenopathy for like uh, patients that burn, people who are diabetic. It really helps those wounds. There's a lot of really nice uses for hyperbaric, but it takes somebody very specially trained to work it for one thing. And two, you're sitting there, and as a patient, you're stuck in this tunnel. You can't get out, you can't go pee, you can't do anything. You're laying in the tunnel under pressure, you pop eardrums, like it's not, it's not the world's best time. But if you're a dive accident and you have the bend, that's a great place to go because it'll really fix you up. Yeah. yeah uh, my, I was telling my dad about it. My dad is ex um, Air Force, oh, yeah. like retired Air Force. And when I mentioned, I don't think there are any hyperbaric chambers left in New Mexico. He was like, what do you mean? Kirtland Air Force Base is here. We have well, okay. like, uh, but right. So I mean, so far as hospitals go. Because actually yeah. for a while, I don't know if you guys know this, but there is a um, O'Neill's up on Juan Tabo. For a brief moment, there was an oxygen bar right next to it. They claim to have a hyperbaric, which scares me out of my mind. I'm like, what the hell? So next to a bar full of fire, you have a hyperbaric oxygen system and an oxygen bar. That couldn't have been a good situation, but yeah, I didn't go in there to see. But no, but actually bases do, and especially a naval base, okay. because they actually have rooms that are this big that are hyperbaric chambers. Yeah. We all could go in it together. That would be nice. And they even have patients. figures, like if the whole ship, something happened to it, they'll yeah. take all the sailors off and stick them in the room. Yeah. Wait, so you think the base would have one? Um, as I don't know about our base in the Air Force, but because people he who says have that. gas embolite, also it happens to aviators and astronauts, so why not? Yeah, because that's what my sense. dad was saying, where like if you're... Um, because he flew in the um, yeah. planes, the CV-22 was his, um, and he would say like if you dis like descended too fast or if you were just like um, went up too fast or something, you'd get a similar sort of well, remember, condition and we as the bad. We talked about our patients. We talked about other yeah. people who get gas emboli, and those are exactly who we're talking about: patients yeah. or people who are aviators and, and astronauts. Because either way, it's going from different like atmosphere. Right. It's just very very. Quickly. You're not designed to work like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting. So heart failure will also create dead space disease. Why does heart failure do that? Why do you think that's a problem? What is that? Why is heart failure, congestive heart failure, going inter to interfere with my ability to exchange gas? Blood gets faster. Right. It's not moving your blood. Circulating. Really good guess. Volume where, though? What happens to people who are really wet? Why do people with congestive heart failure have a bat wing appearance on their x-ray? Why do they cough up white foam or pink foam? Ah! <laughs> yeah. So their lungs back up. So remember, your body is a teacup. Your lungs are a teacup. If they overfill, at some point the teacup is going to spill over and you're going to wind up with water in your lungs. Pulmonary edema. Okay? Pulmonary edema is related very much to congestive heart failure, okay? So if your lungs are a wet sponge instead of a dry sponge, gas exchange is going to go out the window. Make sense? So I pick heart failure. Well, there's lots of ways. I can put the patient on a little bit of PAP therapy, like CPAP. I can give them diuretics, like Lasix. And I also can give them medications that will help the heart be more efficient. Okay, we call those drugs chronotropes and inotropes. There's also one called. Okay, chronotropes, inotropes. Chronotropes, who has ever clocked in with the chrono system for time? Chrono, chrono, that's where it came from. Makes it go faster, okay? Inotropes make the heart squeeze harder. Yep, domotropes do both, okay? So I can give drugs that will help make the heart more efficient, which ought to help it with the bonkiness that happens in heart failure, okay? That's also why people with heart failure, depending on whether it's right side or left side or just generalized heart failure, may have one leg that swells, might have both legs that swell, get that pedal edema situation happening, it's because they're overloaded, okay? Anybody you see who has pitting edema on their limbs, especially their feet, you've got to watch out for heart failure, okay? They're either heart or kidney failure or probably both. Make sense? Okay. Now, dead space diseases are also related to diseases that cause 
cardiac output to go down. So remember, your cardiac output is your heart rate times stroke volume. Cardiac output is how much volume your heart pumps every minute, okay? Supposed to go every minute, okay? We can look at something called ejection fraction too, which is the percentage of blood volume that's pumped. So if anything weird goes on with any of that, I'm gonna have an increase in my dead space disease. Okay, so very simply, something wrong with the lungs, something wrong with the heart, increased dead space disease. Okay? So dead space, blah, blah, blah. Why do I care? <laughs> okay. Dead space is very important when you're looking at something called alveolar ventilation. You guys know what minute ventilation is. What's minute ventilation? Exercising, not when I'm lecturing, not that kind of stuff. But if you're sitting there watching TV, that's what you're doing, okay? Alveolar ventilation is looking at ventilation at the alveolar level. Okay? There's a very specific formula for this. I now need to compare the relationship with what am I giving the patient versus what's actually getting to the alveolar level, okay? And is there something I need to do to correct that? So the formula is very simply, high volume minus dead space is anatomic. Take that first and then you multiply it by the patient's rate, okay? So normal alveolar ventilation somewhere between four to six liters a minute. So if I'm breathing in eight liters a minute, I'm saying only six normally are actually getting to where they need to go. Because we have this natural anatomic dead space. And then if I put you on a vent, well crap, now I have an anatomic dead space, now I have mechanical dead space I have to get past. All of that is coming from how, that is having an effect on how much alveolar ventilation I'm doing. Does that make sense? So if I have a uncompensated respiratory acidosis, I have to increase ventilation, right? So whether I increase minute ventilation or I increase alveolar ventilation, who cares, I have to increase it. So I increase ventilation by, this is what we were talking a little bit about yesterday, So I have stages, okay? If I have somebody with a respiratory acidosis, I need to address it. I have to correct my ventilation somehow. Now, if it's our friends who are COPD patients who have that partially compensated acidosis, I'm gonna ventilate them by putting them on a BiPAP, okay? But if you're not, and you're having an acute problem, I'm gonna intubate you and put you on a vent, right? So let's say I've done all of that, and I already have somebody on a vent and I still have a respiratory acidosis after. I have to fix it. And there's two ways to fix it. I increase tidal volume first until I hit my maximum that I can use, and then I hit rate, or I go above the rate. Okay, so I get to 20. So this is to correct a respiratory acidosis with somebody who is on a vent already. How does the tidal volume correct it? So we're gonna use your ideal body weight Remember, we have that range from six to eight. So I start you off maybe a little bit lower in your range when you get on the vent, and then if I see you're still underventilated, I'm just gonna turn you up until I get to here, okay? 
because time of volume actually helps with our alveolar recruitment, right? If I'm giving you a proper size breath, I shouldn't be getting it to the alveoli where stuff's happening, okay? But if I'm already at eight mLs per kilo as my high tidal volume range, right? I mean, let's say my range is 350 to 600, just to make up numbers, okay? If I start off at 400, then I have all the way to six that I can go to. I would think that if you like, increase your tidal volume, you would just retain more CO2. So increasing volume is how you ventilate. So we're trying to get more of a breath into you to actually have more gas exit, okay? Now, <clears throat> again, these are board rules. <clears throat> so the second one, if I can't do this, I'm gonna go up on the race, okay? Now, there is one more step to that. If they're both max, I'm gonna go ahead and just keep going up on the race because it's safer. And that's where you're gonna be talking about where you don't wanna go up too high on your try to one, because then I can start causing barrel trauma and issues that I'm not trying to deal with. I'll just go up on the rate. So first, go up on tidal volume. Second, increase rate. If I'm maxed on both, go ahead and keep going with the rate because it is safer than taking up the tidal volume. Okay, does that make sense? This is the stuff we're gonna start talking about next week is how to correct blood gases in specific. What are the ways we're gonna do that? Okay. <coughs> are we okay with this? Yeah. All right, so back to our dealer dead space. So I have this lovely formula. I need to figure out what my dead space is. So the first thing I have to do is find out what my anatomic dead space is in order to do this formula, okay? So, oh, four to five, not four to six, but like, in a minute, I forgot about this. Four to five, my bad. My bad, too many numbers in my little tiny brain. You guys feel like that sometimes? <laughs> Get that stuff in here. So alveolar ventilation is also known as alveolar minute volume. It's abbreviated VA. Normal is four to five liters a minute. And low alveolar ventilation causes an increased CO2. Just like low minute ventilation causes an increase in CO2. That all leads to respiratory acidosis. So if I need to fix that, I actually have to turn up my minute ventilation, which will turn up my alveolar ventilation when it's they're related. We'll get to one in the end, but remind me, we'll come back to this just to practice one, okay? But how we correct it, how you increase alveolar ventilation, we have to blow off the CO2. We need to blow it off. So we do that by going up on tidal volume and then going up on rate. That's how we fix it. Alveolar ventilation is increased or improved, is a better word, in three ways. One of which is just getting rid of the dead space. If I can physically remove it because it's mechanical, do that. The next way is to increase my tidal volume, just like we did over here. And then if I've already done that and I still have a respiratory acidosis, then I'm gonna go up on the rate. Now every once in a while, somebody's really breathing too much, and it could be because they're hypoxemic, they're in pain, they're anxious, they're having some sort of mental breakdown, okay? Or it could be because we have the ventilator set too high. <laughs> In which case, we're gonna come down exactly the opposite as the way we went up. So if I have too much alveolar ventilation and I need to change the ventilator in order to correct it, I'm gonna start bringing the rate down first because I know the tidal volume works. That is the safe level that I wanna keep those alveoli recruited. So I'm gonna bring the rate down first and then I can start lowering the tidal volume if I have to, okay? But again, just like any other respiratory acidosis, or having a high minute ventilation or a high alveolar ventilation, I have to find the cause. Because if you're having some physical issue where you are really in agony, we had a patient one day that came out of the OR with her belly opened. 
She was totally awake and aware on that damn vent, and her stomach wasn't even put back together yet. And I walked in there, and I'm like, uh, no, people. <laughs> We're not going to torture this poor woman for the next day and a half because they couldn't take her to close her because she was too edemous that they couldn't fix her. So they were just gonna leave her open. They were like, well, we can get her off the bed. I'm like, you're stupid because tomorrow you're gonna have to put the tube back in order to take her back to surgery. I'm like, no, thank you. Knock her out. We'll talk about this tomorrow. Can you imagine laying in bed with your abdomen opened up? And I come along and section people and make you crawl. Well, that's gonna feel like a good time, right? The stupidity I see sometimes is just mind blowing. <laughs> it's like, oh, would you like to lay there with a nice big wound and yeah, and no pain meds and no sedation? Yeah, no, thank you. Okay. But if that's what's causing it, that's a pretty easy fix. But if it's because I am overventilating with the vent, then I have to correct it. And I do that by taking the rate down first and then coming down on tidal volume if necessary. By the way, I have a cheat sheet coming up for how to fix gases. So if you're not getting all this scribbled down, don't worry. I have it all printed up for you. <clears throat> okay. So if you wanted to try a formula, let's just try go back to our alveolar ventilation and we'll try one just for fun. So my formula is this. So let's say our tidal volume is 600. Let's just say our anatomical dead space, because we figured it out over there, was 65 ml because he's intubated. Okay, and let's say your respiratory rate is 15. Fill all that in, tell me what you get. Baby Hal has a glowing knee, I wonder what that means. Oh, he actually moved, you guys, freaked out, we didn't know. He's looking around the room, he's blinking at people, it's like I said, I made him cry. This poor little girl in the other class, she's like, I can't do it! <laughs> Sorry. So you have to do this part first, and then multiply it by the rate. I don't know if I did my math right, but I got about eight liters per minute. Yeah, you sure did. You wind up with 8,025, right? So I have to make that, I have to divide it by a thousand. So you're going to get something stupid that is this. But it's really going to be, I wouldn't even care to see it back. <laughs> which is pretty high, right? But is it high because I have my tidal volume set too high? I don't know, I'd have to look into it, okay? But that's just how you do the basic formula. Does everybody see that? Anybody have any questions? Because if you just sit there and look pretty, I assume you have it. <laughs> We're good? So remember, you have to do this part before you put it into that formula. All right, a shunt. That nasty little word shunt. Shunt is defined in relation to BQ mismatch as perfusion in excessive ventilation. So what it means is this is the amount of cardiac output that does not participate in gas exchange. Shunting causes severe hypoxemia, and we fix it by giving somebody CPAP or PEEP, because we need to try to have the relationship between the alveolus and the um, <clears throat> pulmonary bed reinstated, okay? So that's what we're using that for. Normal shunt's about 5%. And there are, there are some anatomic reasons you have a small normal shunt, like your bronchial vein, pleural vein, your thespian vein, which actually feed the lung itself instead of just doing body exchange. There's also some capillary shunting that happens. Not a big deal, about 5%. In some rare baby diseases where they have heart anomaly issues, and if you remind me, Kara, what did you have? What was going on with you when you were born? What happened to your heart? Uh, 
I had a lot of issues. Um, the big two were, um, I'm forgetting words right now, I'm so sorry. Uh, basically, the left side to the right side of my heart, I kind of switched around a bit. Um, so they call it transposition of the great vessels? Thank you, that's yep. the word. Yeah, yep. transposition. Yeah, so, so basically your heart, the, the plumbing of the heart is completely backwards. Yeah. And yeah, and so what happens, all of the oxygenated blood doesn't go anywhere. Like it, just, it just keeps circling in a loop. So all the deoxygenated blood just goes around the body over and over again. So that got you your first big heart surgery. <laughs> yeah. um, I also had, um, gosh, words. Uh, what is it like VSC ventricular C, uh, septal, uh, septal ventricular disorder or something like that? Like a VSC. So it's it's um. So if you guys know when a uh, baby mom have all these defect. different ductus that stay open so that blood flow through the fetus is fine because baby anatomy is not like your anatomy in the mom. Okay, because the, the baby is fed through the placenta and through the blood vessel that feeds the placenta. So there's a lot of shunting that happens in a fetus while they're inside mom. When one of the PDA patent ductus arteriosus is a really big one. Um, there's also one between both ventricles. And when the baby's born, when the level of oxygen comes up in the baby system, they'll start to close. And they're supposed to close. Sometimes, though, in rare cases, they stay open and they have to do surgical repairs. Okay? So that would be another reason to have a huge shunt. And they're actually called ductus, patent ductus is on purpose. The holes are open. They're supposed to be while baby's inside mom. And then baby's born. They start to breathe oxygen in the environment, the CO2 changes, and then the sort of close. I always think that's so amazing because my son was born with pulmonary valve stenosis. Yeah. But his stayed open, and like I think it did that to compensate it does. for that valve being yeah. so close. It, your body, it is so amazing that the baby's body <clears throat> is so sensitive to the chemoreceptor changes in oxygen and carbon, uh, or CO2 carbon dioxide, that they'll stay open on purpose. Yeah, there's some drugs they can give to make that close too. They're called prostaglandins, but it's pretty. It's a really. I mean, so if you think about how you ever come into this world, yeah. it's amazing. And the fact mm -hmm. that you start off as a single cell who hooks up at a bar with another cell, <laughs> and you do all of this, <laughs> and you do all of this without an arm coming out of your forehead and this, like it's just amazing to me that it ever turns out right. Like more often than not, we should be walking around with like your body parts sticking out of you. Because really, at the stage, I think it's about four weeks, we all, look, we all look like chickens. We all look like chicken embryos. So you'll have a really fun um, em a class with Miss Polly about all the sweetness stuff, but I've taught it before. <laughs> it's just amazing to me. Like, we should all have arms sticking out of our forehead. Like, something just weird should happen. And it does. Oftentimes, it does happen, but it results in a miscarriage. So people are like, well, gee, I just can't carry a baby. I'm like, but you should be glad in a way, because had you been able to carry that baby to term, something terrible would have been wrong. The body knows this is not how it's supposed to go. <clears throat> I'm just going to take care of this for you. <laughs> you know, I can try again in a few months. Yeah. But I love that. One cell meets another cell at a bar and you try to do this. <laughs> Amazing. <clears throat> or wherever your parents met. I'm not just I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. It was, well, for me, it was the 70s, so God knows. No. <laughs> Are you kidding? My parents, well, you know, I lost my dad in April, but my parents were married for 50 years exactly. But my mom met my dad when she was 14, he was 18. She, they got married when she was 16, he was 20. My grandma had to sign papers back then because it was like not allowed. And they were together for 50 years. So, so mad at him, I was cooking and he was like, we just make a phone call, like I'm waiting around. He's physically in my house. Like physically the box is in my house and I didn't want that at all, at all. But I thought, okay, I'm kind of used to it there now. And I put it on a high touch, which is like eye level to where my dad was to me. So I go talk to it, I don't know why, I'm the stuff you do when somebody dies, like your brain is completely not rational. <laughs> Most of that stuff. But I talked to it. I talked to the box and his pictures on the front of it. And I'm like, will you just, I'm waiting for my phone call, Dad. Like, you're supposed to go over there and tell me that it's amazing and you're sitting on the beach, you know, drinking my tea. I heard none of that. Nothing at all. My friend goes, maybe you're not listening. And I'm like, oh, that could be a problem, you know? All right, so ventilation, <coughs> perfusion, anomalies. Ventilation should match perfectly with perfusion. That's the way you're designed. You breathe in, you're carrying oxygen in the air you breathe in, it gets to the capillary bed, it spins all over the universe, gets to your tissues, right? That's how you're supposed to do. 
but in a lot of cases, you can have a mismatch. So the relationship should be a one-to-one, -one, but sometimes it's not that equal, and a lot of reasons can cause that. So we consider a mismatch when we've gone up on that FA2 to 60, which is that convenient rule, too, for the board. If I've given you FA2 to 60, you have not improved. That is when I've officially made a shunt happen. A shunt is happening. I have found it. I need to treat it now with some pressure. Because man, that little fat LDL I drew, doesn't matter if I dump him full of 100%, it's not getting there, okay? It's not gonna get there. So some other issues you can have are diffusion defects, where you have impaired gas exchange across the AC membrane, causing hypoxemia, duh. And diffusion defects are re related to reduction in surface area, and specifically think about bullous emphysema. Mm. Bullous emphysema is a huge one, because instead of having nice, tight alveoli that look like grape clusters, you have ones that are all blown apart and flopping in the wind and they're not doing anything. Okay, they're not getting any exchange happening. Diseases that cause a thickened AC membrane like scleroderma or sarcoidosis <coughs> or any other chronic inflammatory disease that affects the chest can cause it. And then in the rare case too that you have a low concentration gradient. Again, we're thinking about you know pilots like your dad, Kara, people who are at altitude. If you were to go here to Mount Everest, there's no oxygen up there, right? People die all the time doing stupid crap like that. They actually cart oxygen up there for you, but you know, people still die. So that's kind of a rare one. I think more of a likely scenario where somebody would be in a low concentration gradient would be if like you were, I think about the Twin Towers when they fell and people were trapped under the rubble. That uh, building that went down in Florida and killed all those retired people they were trapped in a very dark space with no oxygen kind of stuff. So that's kind of more of a situation where I would consider low concentration gradient. So it's not like we're all hopping on a plane going to Mount Everest, <laughs> right? But it's not very common. Okay, and I think we'll stop there for a break and then we're gonna review the most and have we pick our beginnings. Any questions? <coughs>